we had a collaboration with some Chinese com uh, Chinese uh, scientists. Here we have a vaccine. What is the problem? Get over it. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, healthcare, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. I hope that it can occur in a, a civil way. I, 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 and I mean civil in a special way, I, peaceful. The biggest question, in, maybe in economics and politics of the coming decade, will be what to do with all these useless people. I just see the need for such a dialogue, and I see the need for action. I see the need for a great reset. We are 208 weeks into two weeks to flatten the curve. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Johnny Anderson alongside Melissa from Cutting Through the Matrix. It has been, well, it's been more than a fortnight since you've been on, uh, but it's glad. I think to, it's uh, been a month. It has been yeah. about a month. Yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah. glad to have you back. How have you been? I have been pretty well all together, all things considered. That is good. That is good. It's good yeah. to see it. Yeah. New new hardware, new camera, everything. Yeah, you're I looking, know. looking well. Yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> like, oh, it's one of those filters. <laughs> it's a filter. Is that what it is? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those things that just changes everything. Sure. It's one of those AI filters. Yeah. Well, I guess we should start <laughs> there then, shouldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> start with the AI thing. Well, um, I wanted to get your take on artificial intelligence, and and Bruce and I have been kind of talking about it a little bit here and there because it's it's getting more prominent, I guess, and they're they're putting it into all these new devices. And we talked about that a, a month or so ago when you were on these new phones, these new uh, Samsung phones, the new Google phones. They've got mm -hmm. all the new AI stuff, and Apple is even pushing software updates now with all of their stuff. Microsoft is doing the same, mm -hmm. and even. Even our hosting provider for this podcast now offers AI features into their publishing sector, which we don't use because we we have our own uh, system that does that. But everything now is is having this massive this massive AI push. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a group of scientists that are out now out of uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, that are saying that we need to stop. AI right now before it's too late. So what's mm -hmm. what when is the when it, in I guess the the question becomes when is the the last signpost saying the road is ending here kind of thing. So yeah. how, how far do we go? Because we're all, like we're we're about to pass the last mile marker I think because before we start seeing massive job losses. Uh, across I, 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 countless sectors across the the economy, you're not going to need. Uh, well, actually, I I heard um, I heard somebody from one of the uh, the Dow Jones companies, one of the the blue chip companies. I can't remember which one it was at the moment, but they said basically, if you're middle management or under, you're doomed. You're finished. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, like banks, um, anything in the financial sector, anything even in the legal sector, uh, as far as like attorneys and things like that, you're you're pretty much done. We've mm -hmm. got instances of AI defense and prosecution sides. They're already winning cases. So where do we where do we draw the line? Where where do we say, all right, that's enough. That that's enough. We have to stop this. Well, who knows? Because I think that they are literally light years ahead of where they tell us that they are. One interesting thing, you know, I've got a Microsoft PC. And even though I have overridden the Microsoft uh, Bing, whatever their ed oh, it's Edge. It's the Edge browser. I don't have that as my default browser, but it, it opens up by default. And I have spent a little bit of time trying to figure out how for it not to open up, but it opens up every day. And for the last month when it opens up, it's AI, AI, AI. You know, it trends, the topics that it gives me trends, but the last month it's just been trending nothing but. And what we were saying in Soundcheck is that this was on, this was the main thing on the agenda at Davos was AI and the future of AI. So I think that the powers that be have gamed this out 
they know how far to take us. I think a lot of this back and forth that's going on, I don't know about this group in Edinburgh, Scotland, because I haven't seen it yet. But I think a lot of the people who are warning of the dangers are playing a part as controlled opposition. I, especially when you look at some of the voices who are warning of the dangers and you see the other kinds of things they get up to. For instance, Elon Musk said years ago and repeatedly in different contexts that both robotics and artificial intelligence were going to eliminate many, many, many of the jobs in the workforce and therefore universal basic income was going to be inevitable. It would be necessary. And yet he just launched this lawsuit with the open AI guys saying, oh, well, you're not holding up your end of the bargain. We all agreed that we were going to put a moratorium. We were going to have a pause. We were going to have a collective pause on how quickly we'd move forward on artificial intelligence. And you guys haven't done that. That seems to be the, the heart of the lawsuit. Yeah. Um, so what are these guys in Scotland doing? What are they saying? I mean, are they? Well, how are they... Um, there's a there's a new book that uh, includes contributions from 50 experts in 12 countries uh, in various disciplines, including uh, computer science, law and sociology. And it delves into the concept of shifting AI from tech driven to human focused improvements. It would ensure that technology aligns with the well-being of people rather than replacing or devaluing human workers. That kind of goes along with guys like uh, Noel Harari, like we have in our opener, where he says, what are we going to do with all these useless people? Uh, mm-hmm. Because that's one of the you were talking about the World Economic Forum uh, in prep and how they're you know pushing this AI driven initiative and things like that. One of the experts from the University of Edinburgh emphasizes that human centered AI aims to support and empower humans contrasting sharply with the technology developed merely to showcase its power. She highlights the generative AI's rise critiquing its development as driven by corporate desire rather than human necessity, leading to technology that people must adapt and compete with rather than technology designed to make someone's life easier. This is kind of what Musk argues. He says that we need to go the AI route as 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 a service. And again, I'm, I'm not endorsing what the guy's saying. Right, At right. the end of the day, he's still doing this Neuralink thing, which I don't agree with. But um, you know, I'm not going to be the DARPA salesman today. <laughs> um, but I do agree. If if we're going to pursue this, then it needs to be, uh, you know, from an from an aspect of of service rather than a replacement. Because if we go down the replacement route, then we are going to be faced with that problem of guys like Harari saying, "What are we going to do with all these useless people? They're they're going to devalue yeah. human life to basically nothing." And they're already doing that enough, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, I mean, it would just be so interesting to be a fly on the wall and. In one of these planning sessions, like in closed doors Davos, where the reporters don't get to go and know where they are on this. Because if you combine artificial intelligence, not just don't think about it from the point of view of how does it serve us or all of the ways in which it's being sold to us right now. It'll help you write better essays. It'll help you do better art projects or, you know, it'll help you do your job better. But if you think about it in as a control factor, how can artificial intelligence control your environment, control what you think? And where is the main server, if you will, for this kind of control mechanism? See, that's the kind of thing that isn't being talked about openly. It. I I think its real purpose is not to enhance or serve or the way that the doomsayers are putting it across is that artificial intelligence will build on itself. It will replicate itself. It will get out of control, you see. And uh, yeah, this is this is one of the aspects I think they're going to pursue that you'll see AI uh, worked into this kind of thing. This is the uh, the new digital wallet that was rammed through the EU EU parliament passed by a vote of two thirds, by the way, that I might add. Uh, It has uh to be ratified by the Council of Ministers. But of course, we know they already have those people in their back pocket and it will be passed anyway. But this will be literally everything that replaces your day to day. This is your digital ID. This is your this is your. COVID passport 2.0. Uh, it's your driver's license. It's your prescriptions. It's your medical information. It's your voting. It's your uh, boarding passes. It's it's everything. Everything that you uh-huh. need. Your health insurance. All, all of it. And it's designed to have everything worked into one thing. All your bank details and every, all all that information. And it's going to be managed by an AI system. And it's going to be 
out there on the, you know, on the web for anybody to just snatch anytime they want. Right, right. Oh, I love that. Users will have full control. You of have full there. control. Yes. And you see <laughs> yeah. it'll be inclusive and voluntary. You see yes. that? And you see they got oh, the old fellow yeah. there that's probably uh-huh. never held a smartphone in his entire life because he's kind yeah. of grasping it there on the edges like, oh, my goodness, I don't know. Do I need to touch this thing? <laughs> so it'll be inclusive and voluntary until uh-huh. just like the vaccine was voluntary. Right. Until yeah. you can't go somewhere until you have it. Yeah. That's your voluntary. Okay, I did. I, I found the article that I was looking for from the World Economic Forum website. This came out February the 29th, and it's called Four Ways AI Could Transform the Economy as We Know It. And one thing that was interesting to me, I, I learned about something in this article that I had not heard of before, AI tokens. Have you heard of those? I know what the uh, the tokens are. If it's well, if it's kind of like what I'm thinking of, where you have a token, says, like a payment token. It, now it, it's a little bit different. It says AI tokens are not to be confused with cryptocurrency tokens. Right. But no, I was they thinking serve more like a um, like an authorization, like a token. So like Apple Wallet or Google Pay or or, or PayPal or something like that. That's a that's a well, token where it, it gives you. A- it it could be that I think I think you're on the right track there. This is what it says. It says it serve they serve as the fundamental unit of computational work in AI applications powered by foundational models such as Chat GPT. AI tokens play a pivotal role in shaping the pricing frameworks for the use of AI foundation models and act as the primary medium of exchange in the age of AI. It gives you a little graph there. So it's got an AI token and then it shows the ways that, so there's um, data that's going to transfer from one entity to another entity. That data comes in the form of a token. So it said it's seamlessly integrating AI, that is, into every aspect of our lives, from enhancing personal assistance that organize our daily tasks to empowering smart cities to efficiently manage traffic and key service. So the, they call this foundational models that have found that have computational tasks and the tokens are used for those computations. It said these foundation models become the driving force behind various sectors and industries. Initially created to quantify and manage computational tasks, the tokens are evolving into a universal currency for transactions. Their application may extend beyond AI services to include a broad spectrum of goods and services akin to the historical role played by gold and fiat currencies. The growing trust and reliance on AI tokens supported by a solid and expanding AI infrastructure offer an attractive alternative to traditional financial systems known for their volatility. As we move towards a digital and AI-enhanced world, AI tokens are set to emerge as a borderless currency, crucial for global economic transactions. This shift marks the beginning of a revolutionary change in our financial systems, establishing a new economy deeply integrated with and fueled by AI. So I think it's interesting because uh, and I only got as far in the research as reading that whole article, but it spurred my thinking. I, someone had put up on the Tragedy and Hope book club chat a link that showed um, Fink, uh, BlackRock's Fink, talking about tokenization. It was a hit, this was a little bit different, but he was basically saying this is the new currency. And I'll I'll send you that link for later. Yeah, but I think know. I think we're headed into a really big shift of control. And I think that the way the control will be exerted is economically. So it's not really going to matter how we play ourselves with the technology on a small scale, you know, on a personal yeah. level. What matters is how do they envision, how have they envisioned, and how is it already being implemented as a mechanism of control? Well, interestingly enough, you mentioned uh, Larry Fink uh, at BlackRock. Interestingly enough, you, you know, um, they're backing out on all of the ESG things. 
uh, all of the the green energy initiative they're backtracking on all that larry fink is saying that publicly now they're backtracking on all of it and what they're going to focus on now is something called uh transitional financing yeah interesting yeah transitional financing so now what they're going to do is uh and we're kind of surmising ned talked about this on on monday uh we're kind of surmising that they're going to now create these giant digital recycling schemes you know, using the, you know, digital currencies and things like that, you know, with this new, whatever it is they're going to create. And maybe this plays a part in what you're talking about because of what you just mentioned. And I was trying to find the connection. Maybe you just found it. But now they're going to create these big recycling schemes to get rid of all this stuff that is non-recyclable. <laughs> so everything that they failed with in the green agenda, they're now going to create a pro um, programs to get rid of it. And they're also working in um, what would an example be of that, of things that they... Well, here's here's one thing they're actually going to do. And again, this was mentioned on, on Monday. They now need the cows. You know how they've been talking <laughs> about getting rid of farming. Now they need the cows. <laughs> Because Shoot, now they're, I, yes, now they're going to listen to, to Monday's show. <laughs> yes, they're going to need the cows now to deal with the new targets that they need to hit. So now they need the cows for the the methane targets that they need to hit. So now the cows are are needed, and yeah, so that that's just one example. Uh, but there are other things. They have they have these giant carbon captured machines. Mm -hmm. Have you seen these mm -hmm. things out of the World Economic Forum? No, I haven't seen a picture. You of haven't them. seen them? Oh goodness! No, no. I'm going to have to see if I can dig them up. <laughs> it is it is a it is the biggest con job next to Al Gore and John Kerry that I've ever seen. Uh, it it's wow. just it's it's terrible. Let me see really quickly if I can dig those up. Hold on, because uh -huh. now. Now you have to see just how insane this actually is. Yeah, see, the, the, uh, what I've seen are the descriptions of the, the forests that are being used as carbon capture. Somehow they take the carbon that the forest releases and then they immediately put it back into some kind of capture thing. Or I've seen the jokes of, you know, where you've got basically a hot air balloon strapped to a cow. <laughs> yes, I have seen that. And you've got Bill Gates that says that he wants to bury 70 million acres of trees in the Pacific Northwest. <sighs> That's not a joke. All right. Um, I'm going to play this in its entirety <laughs> so you can see it. This is uh, this is not a joke. This is something they're actually doing. This is an actual video out of the World Economic Forum. Uh, and these are these are carbon carbon capture machines of some kind. I don't know. That, there, there's no, there's, it's, it's so ridiculous. You couldn't make up the magnitude that it's so ridiculous. There's not even an actual product. They tell you that they're like the scheme of it is there's, they're creating something that does not have a product and that's what they're going to sell. Like I just, I can't even describe just how absurd and ridiculous it is, but this is it. Reactors that are that are packaged into con, you know container sized uh, shipping container sized devices, and so we are building those containers in a factory and shipping them out to site and, and arranging them into a race. When air passes over that material, it absorbs CO2. Uh, when that material is, is loaded, it takes about 30 minutes. Uh, we take that reactor offline, heat it up, and that releases the CO2, which is the product. Uh, and then that reactor is put back in service. So you know, we have hundreds or thousands of reactors operating in unison. So we have some that are always capturing and some that are delivering the CO2. Ingredients for a direct air capture project is that you know you need access to land and land that has the right geology for you know for sequestering the CO2 or a use case for the CO2. And then you also need to be partnered and have access to renewables as well, because direct air capture is a fairly energy and intensive process. There is no real product because ultimately what we're doing is we're doing disposal. And the product that we're generating is actually through the way things are being monitored and tracked, it's actually a fiscal instrument. It's actually a carbon removal credit, which is the actual financial product that we sell. <laughs> so ridiculous. Right, I'll just leave it at that. So there you go. There's <laughs> there's no actual product. It, it use, it, it's going to use more energy than what they're actually getting rid of. So there's no... <laughs> Like there's there's no there's no point to any of that none. Oh, uh, that 
It, it made me think when I was looking at his smarmy, he, he almost was like smirking. It, it, it's as if he knows that what he's saying is the most ludicrous thing that could come out of anybody's mouth, but yet he's saying it. He 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 can barely contain the laughter, at, you know, at the ridiculousness of it. And what I was thinking is how much more efficient things used to be when all the snake oil salesman needed was a wagon to cart around behind him with a few bottles of this and that. Yeah. Well, I think didn't we call cost that... that much money to bamboozle and rip people off, you know? No, no. Now we go on CNN and ABC and CBS News, you know, as Dr. Fauci and we peddle snake oil that way. Yeah. You reach a much it's... wider audience that way, I suppose. Well, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, Business speaking of, is good for psychopaths. It is. Yes, it's very good. And and clowns and buffoons. You know, we pay a lot of clowns mm -hmm. and buffoons these days. I mean, have you seen what passes for entertainment now? My goodness, it's terrible. I think we call it the 2024 election. That's that's insane. <laughs> that's that's a clown show in and of itself. We can talk about a little bit of that, I suppose, if you want. But since we're on the environment, uh, we talked about this a little bit in soundcheck. EPA. Right. The Environmental Protection Agency, you know, because they're there for you. Yeah, they're there to protect yeah. the environment. They are targeting aftermarket car parts. So they're looking at and Bruce talked a little bit about this. They're looking at getting rid of car parts that are 10 years and older. So they're going to target those things through like the dealerships, the manufacturers and places like AutoZone and Advanced Auto Parts, you know, places where, you know, Napa Auto Parts, wherever mm -hmm. you get your, your car parts, they're going to look at going after those things saying, oh, no, see, you have those parts for that car that's older than so-and-so, so so that's not environmentally, you know, friendly anymore, so you can't sell those parts anymore. I thought they were going to use the insurance companies to kind of leverage everybody out and get rid of, get, get everybody out of these um, gasoline and diesel-powered cars and trucks and get everybody into electrics. Well, now, and I don't know if you've been keeping up on, I know you've been, you've been out of the, you know, the news cycle for, for a few weeks now, uh, taking care of things, but I don't know if you've noticed that Ford, GM, Volkswagen, Mercedes-Benz, Audi, Porsche, and I think Aston Martin now in the UK, all of these companies, these are the big auto manufacturers across the West. All of them are now stopping EV production because they can't sell them. I think you did. You and I or, talked about that last month, or it might have been somebody else that I was talking with. Sorry, I, I don't remember. But we did touch on that. And I hadn't heard that. And I, yeah, I find that really interesting. It's, yeah, they're, they're done. So I, I thought they were going to use the insurance companies to kind of say, all right, well, you're going to have to get into this electric car now. But now it looks like they're going to try another approach. And it is quite creative. They're going to say, mm -hmm. sorry, you can't buy those car parts anymore uh, for that car because it's it's damaging to the environment. Mm -hmm. And you were telling me a personal account. You have uh, an older car. And it's quite frankly, I the way you were describing it sounds like it's just still a reliable car. You know, you just mm -hmm. and, and I know a lot of people that have cars that are 15, 20 years old and they're, they're just fine. You know, they do regular maintenance on them and everything, you know, oil changes and uh, fluid changes and you know, regular services and things like that. And there's nothing wrong with them. Mm hmm. Yeah. I uh, there's a couple of things that it uh, I, I told you in soundcheck that I I went to the theater and saw Dune yeah two last yeah. night yeah, Bruce was telling and me I was, about it last night yeah <laughs> and I, I I mean I like sci-fi I never I just never go to the theater I, it's been years of you know people sent things to Alan on disc and we watched it that way and I you know I just don't go to the theater but it was kind of fun. Ate a bucket of that nasty popcorn. Oh, did you? I bet it was half. Yeah. Was it halfway good at least? Did it cost you thirty five dollars for the bucket of popcorn? Well, I have to say that my girlfriend bought the popcorn. Oh, okay, all right. So so you had to fork I over sprang, the cash for the tickets. <laughs> I sprang for the tickets, and she got the popcorn and the drinks. And when I, I just wanted a small drink, and it was six dollars, and oh, I got goodness. two. I got two tickets for ten dollars for both oh, wow. of us. She got the uh, refreshments, and I think she had to spring twenty for two drinks yeah. and a popcorn. Yeah, which yeah, is yeah. just they always insane. Get you into snacks. Yeah, we used to, when it's we were crazy. kids, we used to sneak in like cans of soda and things like that, and like our you know big jackets or any you know stuff like that. We used to sneak yeah. in bags oh, yeah. of M and M's and stuff because yeah. you know you take a bag of M and M's that back then you'd pay fifty cents for. And it was five dollars when you get in the in the door. Yes. So yeah. yeah. No, I know the 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 calculus is in your favor for sneaking it in. But anyway, when we left the theater, we stood outside talking for about an hour, 
And one thing that I noticed uh, out of the corner of my eye, and I finally just turned around and looked at it straight on, it's a small town. You know, I live in a really small town and the town next over is so small that there's one movie theater that just gives you an idea of size. And there was an electric charging station. You gotta be the, kidding me. I am not kidding you. And in this oh, town wow. that I have to I have to drive to the neighboring town to do my grocery shopping or put gas in my car or any number of things that I can't do in this tiny town here. I, I couldn't even believe it. Like I said, I, I've never, I hadn't been to the movies. I hadn't been in that parking lot. It's like in the middle of nowhere. And there you go. There's the EV charging pump, which obviously nobody ever uses because in all my treks into this town, now, if I go up, to, if I have to do something in Dallas, Fort Worth, then I see this, the regularly placed stations and I see the vehicles themselves because there are people who buy them and drive them, but not in this tiny town where they've got the pumping station. I think that what is happening is that the bulk of people around the world, A, we they can't afford these. No, not um, the, it's, no. And if you get rid of the subsidies, we, we actually went over the cost of those. If you get rid of all the subsidies and the tax stamps and credits and, and all that stuff, the average, we, we actually broke it down. The, the Tesla Model 3, which is like their base model, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the company, they sell their base model. And it's, I think it's like 32,000 if you buy it yeah. brand new. For a new car, that's not bad. Obviously not for an electric car. But if you get rid of all of the, the tax credits and everything that goes to the company that they then cut down because they don't have to pay them because they're passing them on to you, one of those cars would cost you over $100,000. Uh, and then, yeah. the, and then on top of that, the battery pack that you have to replace between seven to 10 years after you have the car will cost you right now for a Tesla $28,000 mm -hmm. to have that replaced. Now, mm -hmm. there's an even bigger problem with all of this, that, which by the way, you can't recycle the batteries if that's not bad enough. You might as well just buy a new car for $28,000, mm -hmm. you know, the battery pack. And, you know, obviously you expect that price to come down, but that's that's beside the point. You know, you're creating a bigger, a bigger environmental problem, not to mention the carbon footprint that they love to beat you over the head with through every leg of this manufacturing journey for those things, which they use petrochemicals to dig them out of the ground and refine them with, yeah. which, is, which is hilarious. <laughs> but then, then... Even that guy that you just played was talking about how much fuel it takes basically yeah, to do this yeah. incredible And you have to use petrochemicals yes. to, to truck those things out there and to stack uh, them, which is even worse. So then you have the problem of this. There is no secondhand market. You know, there's no used car market for a, for an electric mm -hmm. car. It just doesn't exist. It doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I'm going to go back around to the point. You're saying you thought that they would be doing it through EVs and yes. through insur insurance. And you thought they'd yeah. really get to you by the insurance. If you're not yeah. driving an EV, if you're not complying, then your insurance rates jack up. Well, you made me think about a conversation that I had a few months back with a friend of mine who works at AutoZone. And he is not a young gentleman, meaning he's not 30 or 40. And he told me that he cannot believe. Thanks. <laughs> he Thanks. You're, you're a young fella. But he told okay, me. Okay, I'll go with it. Yeah. Yeah. He told me that he could not believe the people that come in, a lot of them young men, some young women too, but they have no idea what they need. He he had a guy come in looking for a part for his vehicle and he did not know what model it was, what year it was. He wasn't, you know, he said, well, it's a Ford. And he got angry that that he Just, wasn't able. <laughs> it's a Ford. Okay. In hopes that the company might turn a profit, it's entirely possible they could have made more than one model and something of more than one year. <laughs> then he went on to tell me that people, he said, younger men just don't seem to be able to do anything and they don't have the interest in learning it. He said on more than one occasion, on two occasions, women have come into the store to purchase windshield wiper blades for their vehicle. And he said, as the courtesy, they'll just say, would you like me to put it on the car for you? So he went out to put these wiper blades onto the car for this woman and a perfectly healthy looking young man was sitting in the car playing on his cell phone while my friend put the blades on there 
And he said, it's just pitiful. So what I'm saying without just hammering and hammering and hammering the younger generation, this is something that Alan would say in his day for him, he needed to know this was an intellectual pursuit. It was curiosity. How does this thing work? Whatever that thing was, is it a radio, a television, a computer, a car? A, a TV? What What are you looking at? What are you playing with? What are you driving? How does it work? If it breaks down, how do I fix it? And of course, Alan could fix many, many things himself, but it came from curiosity. And also, I'd like to be able to be self-sufficient. I don't want to have to pay somebody a thousand dollars to do what I could probably figure out how to do. So if you combine the fact that they're going to make things, what I'm saying is, the generation that is living through this right now, they probably don't notice and they don't care. If a young guy goes into AutoZone and he all he knows is that he drives a Ford, is that somebody that's going to, you know, whine and moan because the part's missing it's no longer available no and this is this has been an ongoing thing i remember uh, i want to say around maybe 10 15 years ago possibly even longer than that we were saying back then you know the the cars now are just they're so they're so jammed full of electronics i can't turn all that crap fast off fast Mm -hmm. enough when i get in there you know Mm -hmm. i i don't need i don't need a car to yell at me to tell me that or take over that's where we are now (laughs) to take over to park (laughs) I can park the car, you know. Now, I do I do see a benefit to some of the things that they do. There is a benefit to having the larger display with the camera. So you've got the side camera, the you know, the camera in the back. That does help when you're in like European um, areas, you know, like car, you know, streets and, and car parks and things like that, because sometimes things over here are a little bit tighter of a squeeze than what they are in the U.S. So mm-hmm. it does help to not back into something because you get a different angle that you can't see from your mirrors. Mm-hmm. But as far as the car, they have these these things now. And I drove a uh, drove an SUV. I had an SUV on on a lease uh, two years ago. I remember that the SUV has this. It had this feature where it would keep you in between the lines. And it would keep yes. you at, at uh, a distance. You, you read my mind or else we're just on, you know, whatever, because I was about to tell you yeah. about riding in somebody's SUV that had that. And oh, I'm like, are you kidding? Oh, no, 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 no. This is th- this thing. I, I felt like every time I was driving the car that I was fighting it. Yeah. I, I was having a, a literally a, a hand to hand fist fight with this car because it was fighting everything that I wanted to do. Like it Could knew better. Could yours be disabled? I finally, I finally yeah. figured out. They don't tell you in mm-hmm. any of the manuals mm-hmm. or the books. I fi- I had to go through, and it took me about a week to figure out how to disable it. But you mm-hmm. had to go through all of like the settings, and it was like five or six menus deep into you know one of the the sub menus to actually get it turned off and to keep it off. Mm-hmm. And it was I I cannot I cannot stand that kind of stuff. I don't no. I don't need a car to tell me how to drive or to, you know, whatever that that's, that's counterproductive. I I felt almost afraid to drive it in certain cases because I didn't know what the car was going to stop me from doing. And I thought it was going to cause me an accident, cause me to, to be in an accident. And I know, I know somebody who actually had that problem. They hit. Uh, they, they started aquaplaning. They were getting on, off onto an off ramp, and they uh-huh. started uh, hydroplaning when they were, you know, going off. And they were a somewhat professional driver, as in like they drive race cars as a hobby on the weekends, kind of thing. So they uh-huh. know how to drive. And this car took over. Yes. When they started to just go out of control, and he had to fight the car, and he still rolled it over twice. He had to fight the car to stop the accident from actually being worse than what it was. Oh my goodness! Yeah. See, this is the thing, too. I mean, I think if you're talking about mindset and how, you know, all they have to do, Alan was fond of saying, if you want to change people, just change, you know, change something in the environment or add something new. So you put a television in the environment or what you have, you know, self-driving car till people don't know how to do it. And you introduce that through things like that. I was um, on a bit of a road trip with my cousin summer before last, and she had a new SUV. She was driving her husband's SUV, but I was the passenger. And she was telling me about that lane, you know, keeping her within the lanes. And I said, oh, are you kidding me? Because that would drive me crazy. And she said, well, there's a way that you can override it, but I don't mind it. It, it, you know, so I'm like, okay, well then, uh, I, I mean, it just, look, first of all, automobiles for me represented freedom. 
when you grow up in Texas, everything is a long distance away. So you get a car. So I, the, I had already saved up the $300 I needed to get a Honda Civic before I turned 16 and $300. I could drive. $300? Yes. My first <laughs> for car. For a Honda, a Honda Civic. <laughs> yeah. That's 30000 now, I think, for one that has 250000 miles loved, on it. I loved that car. And... um but all, the other thing about it, too, was that it was a standard. And so I learned to drive on a standard. And I always liked that. And people go, oh, well, how do you? Li-? Well, because a standard automobile, you've got control. I decide when I want to be in a low gear or a higher gear. And, you know, I just like that. You know, I, I like to drive. I don't yeah, want yeah, the sure. car I'm to not drive lazy. for you know, me. I like to work for it. You know, it's yeah. Fun. <laughs> so, but now you've got people that, you know, they want the car to drive them so they can. I don't know what they're doing that's so important well, on that Google, phone. Yeah. Go- Google actually said this a number of years ago. They said that they were working on an autonomous a vehicle for you know mm-hmm. like a software thing for for their cars and their actual company statement on the matter was you needn't worry about stressing yourself with driving every day you need to be doing more important things like enjoying a glass of wine and a baguette <laughs> okay so apparently that's what we need to be doing well evidently snobbery is the marketing tool there you know everybody yeah. wants to be chauffeur driven and so you know they appeal to oh i could just hang out in the back with my wine or champagne or whatever but no you know I, I i don't get it so where does that take us i was thinking about some well i'm just thinking about the way in which you know culturally people are changed they don't want freedom they don't value that they don't want control they don't value that it's okay for something else even an inanimate object to be in control Another thing, you know, just speaking from a psychological point of view, having that road trip with my cousin, we were somewhere, it was after dark, it might have been 10 p.m., but she wanted to make some time. And she got a call from her husband and he said, why did you get off the highway? Yeah. Come again? Yeah. He said, why did you get off the highway? Now he's in Miami. He's uh-huh. in Miami where they live. And we were on our way on our road trip from Texas to Miami. And, you know, uh-huh. so we had detoured for uh, some reason, uh, some routing reason that we that she thought was a good idea. And he immediately knew it. And I said, well, what's going on? And he he said on the speaker on the phone, because she's hands free. It's all the latest Whistles yes. and bells. That actually is that is good. I have to be honest. The, the hands free thing that the, you know, the Bluetooth connectivity to, with your phone to the car because oh, yeah. I don't know if you've driven and, and talked on like holding the phone up to to your. I don't know if you've done that, but oh, I would but, never do that. <laughs> yeah, well, you can't do that here. Where, at least where I live, it's it's illegal. Oh, yeah. you, like you can't even touch your phone. So you you have to have it on on the you know the the Bluetooth or whatever. And I find that beneficial because. Uh-huh. I have in the States, you know, before they put laws in place to, to stop you from actually talking on the phone while you were driving in, in certain areas. Um, but I remember when I would talk on the phone, it was like I would I would have a hard time focusing on traffic because I was more focused on the phone call. So well, there's two two things about that. Um, the first one is that, yes, it's here. I've got another cousin who lives in Texas and his insurance company, speaking of getting to people through insurance, if he has his phone on when he's in the car. So this is surveillance. Think about it. GPS surveillance, the insurance company's connection to what you're doing. If his phone is turned on and he's in the car, he gets a demerit point on his insurance premium. Really? I've not heard yes. this before. Yeah. Well, that's a Just fact. on? Just on. He must have his phone turned off. Now, I don't know what kind well, of a hands- know? How do they know if the phone is on or off is the bigger question. I don't know. And why do they have access to that information? Exactly. And why would that be okay with my cousin? You know, (laughs) why why would that? Yeah. Why would you do business with that insurance company? I don't care if they're giving you a better rate or not. Mm -hmm. Well, but back, back to the other story is that this other cousin, her husband had put a piece of software tracking device on the car that connected to his phone. So he always knew where his car was, exactly well, where it was. Yeah, we we kind and of have course that now with OnStar, uh, if if you know the OnStar system that General Motors has. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's like a personal OnStar kind of setup. 
Yeah. OnStar is, I actually, I, I kind of agree with, with OnStar. I don't believe in this, you know, that having it reversed back and, and, you know, taxing you by the mile. That that was something that they that was under Agenda 21, where all cars would be fitted with these things, where you'd literally be, you know, charged per mile that you would drive. Um, but I I do like the fact, because I, I know somebody that had the OnStar system. I've never actually used it, so I can't speak from personal experience, but I can talk about people that have. Mm-hmm. They actually found themselves in Oklahoma on one of those, you know, not from there. And they found themselves out in the middle of nowhere, which is easy to do in Oklahoma. And they didn't know where to go. And they, in some of those long stretches of road, you don't have phone service. You know, you don't have, have cell phone service. They were actually able to get in contact with OnStar and, and get them, you know, back into the right, because it goes through a satellite. They were able to get back into the right place. That was one case. Another case I've heard, if there's a stolen car, then they can shut the car down remotely. I, I like that. So you can, you know, if your car's stolen. Um, and but I also wait, like. Wait, wait just a second. Keep your thought and about what you also like. Just think about uh-huh. that for a moment. Mm-hmm. What if they don't like something that you're doing in your car? There is that. Yes, there is that. So if if they could have done that to everybody during COVID, they would have. So there is yeah. that. There is the other side to that coin. Yes, yeah. I do agree. So it's not, you know, there's nefarious purposes behind it too. Uh, and I also like the fact with that system they can unlock your car. So you don't have to spend X amount paying, you know, a locksmith to come out and, you know, break your window or whatever it is to, to get into your car to unlock your car if you lock your keys in your car. So I can see that as a, you know, there are benefits, but again, you know, there's a nefarious side to it too. Well, yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll just, uh, I'll take it out there and, uh, you know, talk about the less. Okay. So I then, if this is a technology that I use and I avail myself to it, I have missed a very valuable lesson about map reading and watching and paying attention and not taking the right turn and not locking my keys in the vehicle. There are so many valuable lessons that I have failed to learn about self-responsibility. And what really galls me and gets under my skin is I don't want anybody to know where I am anytime and what I'm doing. That's How just dare weird. you? How dare you talk about personal responsibility and not wanting people to know where you are? Yeah. How dare you? Um, no, I, I agree with you. Uh, there There is a bigger lesson to learn in personal responsibility and map reading, but we don't need to do map reading because we have Google Maps now. That's right. And we, we don't need to lock our keys in the car because forget OnStar. A friend of mine has that system tied to his smartphone. His key fob is his smartphone. So that's how he starts his car. And he locks his car and he unlocks his car is his phone. Oh, yeah. And and he probably does all of his banking and everything else. And even even his home, like his his house, like his door locks are on it as well. He can lock and unlock Uh his front door with it. Yeah. Well, that's see my cousin with the you know car that her husband monitors or whatever, and it keeps her in the right lane at all times. She just tells her phone, you know, oh, Alexa, uh, open the garage door. Alexa, turn on. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Oh, well. I know she's not listening right now, so I can get away yeah. with saying this. But it's very educational to see how it other is. people live. It, it is. And I, I can't like I, I would just I'd be going crazy. I, I don't want that stuff anywhere near me. So I mm-hmm. guess that is the like that's the line that gets drawn. Right. Because going back to the original point, where do we say that we've passed the last signpost? Well, the last signpost, I think we've already passed it in that. You know, in that respect. Yeah, I, I think I think what is at stake here is the next level of control. And I think in many, many ways, we're already there, whether we are cognizant of it or not. And I think that there's these groups will come out and they'll say that they're speaking for us or they're advocating against tighter regulations on it. But I think that the barn door has already been left open because that was by design. You know, this is where the ruling elite said this two decades ago, if not longer. This is where we're going technologically. So by the time we're all talking about AI, we may have been living under it for a decade unaware. How do we know? How would we know? Well, that's a good question because I look at some of the things that are out there now, you know, the, these new AI developments with these phones and mm-hmm. none of it's real. Not Like you can create what isn't there 
with it yes. in, in real time. So that is a that is a very good question. Yeah. Is how much of what we're seeing is actually real? Yeah. You know, I and I've seen these uh and they're getting better, but I've seen some of these deep fakes. There's a couple of them floating around out there with um one of them is the North Korean guy, uh Kim Jong un, and another one is of uh Vladimir Putin. And mm-hmm. we've I mean we know that they're fakes, but they're pretty convincing. I mm-hmm. have to say they are they are pretty convincing. Yeah, um, I saw so I saw a demonstration of some deep fakes. They were using Obama a, in this example, and they said which one is the deep fake, and they gave you like four different ones. And I really studied them, and I couldn't figure it out. And they said, well, they're all deep fakes in in that particular. Yeah, interesting. So, the, but you, the voice prints. To, yeah, the voice yeah. print. If you if you have no visual representation, if you just look at the voice prints, I honestly I can't make the distinction. I mm-hmm. I've heard I've heard a real one. Uh, they took this with uh, with Joe Rogan. Uh, they they played a clip of Joe Rogan saying something, and then you know saying one line, and then another clip of him saying another line, and I cannot tell the difference at all. Yeah. And one thing he actually said, and one thing he didn't. I I mean. And this is a because we've all been we've all seen how people are now convicted or shadow banned or censored or, you know, me too or whatever in real time there. There's no longer the court of appeals where you can take your case and say what is and you're convicted now de facto simply because somebody saw it online or they heard it online. They don't bother to come and say, is this true or let's investigate. It's just like, well, we saw that. So I think this is going to have some pretty yucky ramifications for people because we don't have the tech. I don't have the technology to duplicate something like that. I can't generate a deep fake. I mean, you know, I'm sure that there are some university students who've got better equipment than mine who can do some pretty impressive work. But um I, I think a lot of us will be victimized by this technology, not helped. I agree. I completely agree. Well, I suppose that will draw everything to a close for the week. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you back. It's it's nice to see that everything's gone well for you and look, to, look forward to having you back in two weeks. Yeah, this will reset you back on your two-week timeline, I think. I'm happy to be back in two weeks. I thank you for having me and it was fun. This was an easy breezy conversation. I hope there was something useful there for people. I think all things. I always I feel like when, say that. I, when I laugh too much, I'm like, uh oh, nothing, nothing serious got communicated. I had all these really good quotes about Russia and some, you know, good stuff pulled up and ready to go. Oh, no, as it we turned talk out, about I, Naval- <laughs> Do you want to talk about Navalny for a few minutes? We have a few extra minutes. Do you want to talk about Navalny? <laughs> well, yeah. Speaking of Russia, I, I, honestly, yeah, I'm yeah. just going to throw it out there. I don't know if I've even said this publicly yet. I don't think he's dead. I, I'm just going to say it. Um, that, yeah. That's my opinion, because nothing is, in, in my opinion, if you look at where the timeline of events where he actually emerged and you know he came to Germany and then you know he, he says, well, I'm f- fleeing Putin trying to kill me. And then he goes back there. And it's a mm-hmm. certain death mm-hmm. sentence. You know he's going to go to prison. And then all of a sudden he dies in prison above the Arctic Circle and there was not a body found. <laughs> and then there's a funeral. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like it just nothing, nothing plays in, in my mind. Not nothing at all. I'm inclined to go that direction with you because I wasn't following him during, you know, the, the so-called I'm, I'm the biggest dissident period of his life. But when I saw how much the mainstream press was pushing his death and the funeral and the body being returned to his mother, you know, and it's like, first of all, why was it returned to the mother, not the wife? I mean, it was just the whole thing was bizarre. And the more that I dug, the more that I thought, oh, this guy is clearly controlled opposition. His wife, I mean, he and him, his wife are both chosen. They've got a look that just says, you know, we're, we're controlled opposition. Yes. <laughs> yes. And they, that's, and nothing that's what, adds up. No, nothing, nothing adds up. And that's, that's something that they've done. Uh, tr- traditionally, even all the way back into the Soviet times, they they always create the controlled opposition through their state intelligence services, so they can mm-hmm. root out. You know, it's it's a real controlled opposition movement, so they mm-hmm. can root out the you know the domestic resistance of whatever that might be 
uh, in there. And this is this is kind of what they do in the U.S. with groups like the Patriot Front that are run by the FBI mm-hmm. <laughs> kind mm-hmm. of thing. It's the same thing. You know, their their um, illustrious leader was just arrested and put in jail. I don't know if you saw that. He made bail uh, and he's back out oh, now. Uh, yeah, he's I, fighting I've the missed, charges. I've yeah. missed this whole thing. Yes. Yes. I know. It's it's t- you, you know, you really feel for him. You, you do. <laughs> I've I, missed all of that. I, I was watching a clip of the Patriot Front. You've seen these guys before, right? You know, the khaki cargo pants and the. Yeah, you know, the yeah, yeah. Yeah, the blue, you know, jumpers and the white balaclavas and everything. And if you, I'm sorry, if you look at the typical FBI agent, that's what they wear to the office. They, they do. <laughs> and like, how many times have you seen they're out on like a, you know, a raid or a job or something and they're, they're wearing the same thing, the boots, the, you know, the, the khaki cargos and the blue jacket that says FBI on it. They were going through Grand Central Station in New York because they were going to an anti-abortion rally. And there are people standing there drinking their coffee, saying to them as they're walking by, you guys can't even change your outfits before you leave the office. What's wrong with you people? It's like, <laughs> it's just laughable. It's laughable, this stuff. <laughs> yeah. No, we, we we really are just hopelessly naive when we take these things at face value. You've got to question everything that you're looking at. And with Navalny, you know, I, I'm looking at him going, really, that the, the head of of the 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 main dissident in Russia has a cleft chin like a movie star. <laughs> uh-huh. He's yeah. married to this strapping blonde woman, you know, like, OK, all right. I mean, they look right out of central casting. You know, who are the primo specimens of, you know, Russian good health? And yeah, uh, uh, that's who our dissident is, you know, so that meanwhile, the average Ivan or Igor or whatever, who really doesn't like what's going on over there. It's like they get no, trapped no, no. in it. It's it's like yeah. it's like with the Epstein thing. It's it was a honey trap. You know, they do the same. Mm-hmm. Thing. They'll create those groups to get good minded people mixed up in that real, real disgruntled people. They'll get them mixed up in that mm-hmm. uh, and they'll they'll target that and they'll use that as as a, a you know, a um, what's the word I'm looking for? A poster child, uh, for mm-hmm. lack of a better term. To demonize everybody and go after go after all the opposition that actually pops yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll let you wrap it up. It was all right. fun, fun, it's, fun it's, for me. It's, it's absolute <laughs> pleasure. It's always great having you on. So I will see you in two weeks. That right. is Melissa from CuttingThroughTheMatrix.com. I encourage all of our listeners to get over there and take a look at the treasure trove of information where she and the other curators maintain the life collective works of the late, great Alan Watt. Again, that is CuttingThroughTheMatrix.com. And her podcast is Real History with Melissa. That is available everywhere you get your podcasts. It's been an absolute pleasure. I will see you in two weeks, Melissa. Thank you for being here today. Thank you to all of the listeners. God bless everyone and have a great evening. Thank you.